Our, our next speaker for today is Professor Jeremy Dobier. Jeremy is a professor of law at the University of Ottawa. Jeremy's research is in the areas of innovation, intellectual property, global trade and development, clean and, uh, technology, and digital economy. As an award-winning professor, uh, Jeremy is recognized for his exceptional contribution to research and law teaching. Jeremy is, uh, is also a practicing lawyer and consultant. Today, Jeremy is going to talk about regulation of big data and open data concept. He's asking the question, who owns open uh, ag data? Please join me in uh, welcoming Professor Jeremy Dobier. Thanks, Lana. I wanted to start by uh, thanking Morris and the uh, event organizers for the opportunity to present here and acknowledging the incredible work of Amber and all of the uh, team of staff and students that went into making this a success. It's uh, extremely impressive for me, um, who's been involved in the project from the start. This is my first symposium I've presented. It's extremely impressive to see the transdisciplinary nature of the work uh, that's being done, and it's uh, very energizing and exciting, so I'm, I'm pleased to be a part of it. Um, speaking of a transdisciplinary approach, so I'm a law professor and a lawyer, but I'll, I'll try not to act like one. Actually, I've got uh, deep roots in plant breeding. My grandpa, my paternal grandfather, was, um, was a vegetable grower in Ontario, and uh, my maternal grandfather bred flowers, chrysanthemums. My, uh, my late father-in-law, uh, grew oats and peas and barley and wheat and canola just outside of Leask. Uh, and although I'm from Ottawa, actually my roots are here in Saskatchewan. I'm a graduate of the College of Law and, uh, and the College of Commerce before that. So it's a real uh, special opportunity for me to be back here. What I'm going to speak about, this topic of ownership of open data, uh, wouldn't be possible without um, a, a collaborative team of researchers. I work closely with Peter Phillips and uh, Stuart Smythe and, and others, and at the University of Ottawa, some of you may have met my student Megan Blom. Last year, she's been active in this research, and Jeremy Barbet. Uh, and it's also important to note that this has been possible because of uh, co-funding relationships between the Canada First um, Research Excellence Fund and the Tri-Council SHRC and the IDRC, and so a lot of actors have really come together to enable me to do this research on ownership of open data. All of you have, or most of you should have, uh, graphic that I prepared, which you can follow along here. The slides are derived from the graphic. If you don't have these, I think um, there might be some more available. I've got a couple up here. They're scattered around the room. And so I want to talk about the tensions between access to and control over data. And so I'm going to talk about ownership interests as a way of reconciling this paradox between property rights in data and open access to data. So what I thought I would do is start off by describing some of the social, technological, and legal governance structures that currently apply to data, and then explain what the law currently is on ownership of all of the kinds of data you've been discussing here for the last day and a half, and then talk a little bit about um, what's coming down the pipeline, uh, particularly internationally, how new governance mechanisms are likely to evolve and unfold over the coming years, okay? So my first and sort of most fundamental proposition is that ownership rights are a major factor in the power dynamics around open data for agriculture and nutrition. And what we're thinking when we step back from the research that we're doing and we think about the impact on society and, and theme four, the developing world, power dynamics are a major factor here. And if we want to avoid some of the uh, pitfalls that have been experienced in encouraging adoption of genetically modified organisms, this, this tension over ownership of data is going to be a major factor that we need to confront sooner or later, okay? So one of uh, the things I was going to spend a, a lot of time on actually, but I don't need to having heard the last day and a half worth of presentations is what are the sources of open data? The sources of open data are all of the things that you've been presenting about today. So we're talking about field collection by uh, drones or 
tractors. Now, sometimes these tractors are not, uh, the equipment that we're talking about is not the equipment deployed by researchers, but sometimes it's um, commercial equipment, uh, uh, John Deere, for example. Um, and, and farmers often will hack or manipulate that equipment to collect different kinds of data. That triggers real ownership questions. Um, in much of the developing world, the type of data that's being collected is not the big data that we're discussing here in this context, but it is data nonetheless, and it provides a different kind of challenge in respect of, of ownership of that, um, of that data. It can be um, data collected in terms of weather patterns by satellites, not just drones. It can be data collected by mobile phones, um, or it can be data that's generated through collaborations, like like that's happening here. So not just the, the field data, but other kinds of qualitative data. Now, one of the really, I think, important things to realize is that there's a distinction between some of the information that's being collected through this initiative and, and all of the research that we're doing together and data in the way that term is, is typically used. And in particular, uh, there's a, a legal question and a governance question over whether an image is data or whether an image is a source of data. And that's going to be important. I'll explain why in just a couple of minutes. I don't think that I need to say much. I don't think I'm qualified to say much about the technical aspects of data governance. That's something that a lot of people have already spoken about here. I'm talking about standards for interoperability, the technical aspects. What I'd like to focus on instead are some of the legal and the social aspects of governing access to and control over data. So in terms of social issues, one of the most significant factors are the norms and practices that we engage in around our data. Irrespective of what legal rights we may or may not have, the way we behave with data itself is a, a mechanism to govern that data. And th that's quite important. There are also ethical issues associated with data collection, particularly when it comes to sharing benefits with the communities from which the data was derived. And that's not, strictly speaking, a legal issue. It's a moral issue, and it's potentially an issue we need to raise with our research ethics boards um, at the institutions that are, are, um, are, are running the research. But it's not really a legal issue. There are a wide range of legal issues in respect of data that are important to understand. And one of the, I guess one of the first principles to recognize is that when we're talking about data as the primary research result or research output generated by a project, the typical discourse around science and technology transfer doesn't apply in the same way. Now, when you think about the kind of valuable outputs that, that researchers typically produce, we think about patents and plant breeders' rights, and we think about copyrights, especially in our, in our scientific publications, okay? Now, if you look, and I did this morning actually looked at the University of Saskatchewan's collective agreement, there are provisions that clearly specify what happens with ownership uh, and commercialization of inventions, patentable inventions. And there are policies around access to scientific publications, right? The journal articles you produce. This is familiar. But data falls in this sort of gap between an invention that you might patent and an article that you might publish. So how do we deal with this? And what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes just giving you a kind of a primer on what legal rights do various stakeholders have in data. Um, and those stakeholders include three main categories of people. Um, those are contributors, collectors, and consumers. So the contributors are the people who provide the data or in respect of whom the data pertains. It might be um, the, the grower uh, on whose field the data is collected. That's sort of like the, the data provider. Then the collector is typically an intermediary. It might be a... Um, a research program like PERC or an individual professor or a government entity or private sector actor, that's the collector. And then there are consumers of data um, and oftentimes consumers play these dual roles because they're also collectors of other kind of data. So when we talk about 
open data, we're talking about sharing between different um, people who are in some respects uh, collectors and some respect consumers. Now, let me give you an example. So typically, we, we, we say copyright law applies to the uh, production of, of information uh, like data, but, but I have to tell you, data itself is not copyright protectable. You cannot get copyright anywhere in the world over facts. So think about uh, the weather, meteorological data. That is simply something that happened. By observing that and collecting data about it and logging that data, you can't claim exclusive rights to use it. Now, images here are somewhat different. If you think about um, a photographer, a photographer can generally exert a lot of creativity in framing a, a shot, deciding on exposure and, and um, uh, aperture, all those sorts of things, lighting. And so you can get, a photo, you can get copyright in a, in a photograph, in an image. Now, when you commission somebody else to do it, like maybe a grad student, for example, then, it, the, then it's, like, uh, it's like your wedding photographer. You commission the wedding photographer to take your, your photos, but you actually own that as the person who commissioned it. But where things get really tricky is when the machine takes the photo without human intervention. And I gotta say, this is a really thorny area globally. The answers are, there are no clear answers to who owns copyright, if anybody, in photographs taken by machines. The closest precedent we have comes from the monkey selfie case. I don't know if any of you remember this. There was a British nature photographer who uh, set up a, a camera and uh, much like our, our poster there, which I thought was excellent, by the way, and he, let, he, he sort of laid the trap for the, the monkey to come and take a selfie. And then when this got posted to Wikipedia, claimed that he owned copyright in it. Um, the United States Copyright Office incidentally said that uh, animals cannot, actually it didn't say animals, it said non-human created photographs don't have copyright, which I believe would include photographs created through artificial intelligence. And that's where we're going here. Now in Europe, I think the law is a little bit different. There is protection for computer generated art now, incidentally, um, PETA actually sued on behalf of the monkey, suggesting that monkeys should be able to own copyright. They just lost that case in January. Okay, so you cannot get copyright in uh, data, but you can get copyright in an image. So ask yourself, is an image data, and, and how does that really work? That's one of the big questions. You can, however, get copyright in compilations of data. Anybody recognize this? My students have all kinds of trouble with it. It's a phone book. A phone book, yeah. Anybody remember phone books? This is a great example of how you can get data in, or copyright protection in what's called a compilation. So although the underlying data itself is not protected, you can get intellectual property rights in an original selection and arrangement of data. So if you select the fields, and the array, if you create an original selection and arrangement of data, then you get copyright protection in the database, but not the data itself. And a great analogy is when you compare, for those of us of a certain age, the white pages to the yellow pages. So the white pages is not original because it's simply an alphabetical listing of everybody with a phone number and, and the name corresponding to it. But the yellow pages involve some, some creativity in the selection and arrangement of the types of categories that you might include. So when you're thinking about your database and whether it's protected, ask yourself, is this the white pages or the yellow pages? And that's the answer to whether you can get copyright protection. Just as an, an aside, in some other jurisdictions, the European Union and all of its member states most notably, you get special protection for databases themselves, a special kind of like light copyright, database rights. Now, one of the things that we need to recognize when we're talking about legal protection for data and databases is that in the environments we're working, all of this data, or most of this data anyways, is digital data. And so when we're dealing with digital data, there's another layer of legal protection 
that you can invoke, which is protection for the technologies that protect copyright. It's illegal to access data protected by what are called technological protection measures. So the simplest example is a password protected file. If somebody circumvents that password to access your data, you can sue them for circumvention of a technological protection measure. If you want another example of what a technological protection measure is, anytime you've realized that Netflix doesn't quite have the selection you want, or you can't watch the YouTube video that you, that you really want to see, or trying to access the Colbert Report but can't because of Canadians' overly polite attitudes, these are technological protection measures that are illegal to circumvent. And this kind of protection will apply to protect the databases that we're creating. Okay? So that's, that's another thing. Now, there's a whole other range of information here, or another range of legal rights that protect information, and that's trade secrets and confidential information. So one thing to realize is that simply by keeping your data secret, it's protected. If you take efforts to keep it secret, and the information itself is valuable. And so that's protected against... Um, you know, it's sort of like, like a kind of corporate espionage. Your trade secret can be protected. Now, what's really important to realize is that, and I'll, I'll come back to this um, in, in just a couple of minutes here, internationally, there, there are treaties and agreements that are enacting new kinds of protection for data. And it's coming in the agricultural sector. It already exists in certain countries, and it's coming and it's becoming more widespread. And what we're looking at is, you know the way that um, clinical trial data is protected in the pharmaceutical industry? So we are seeing, and uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, for example, before it, it dissolved or, or collapsed with the, with the U.S. withdrawal, um, had a provision to provide, to extend the same kind of data protection that we see in the pharmaceutical industry to agricultural-related data in all of the countries that would have been signatories to the, the TPP. So this is coming, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, is that model, the, the clinical trial data in the pharmaceutical industry, the kind of model that we want to see adopted for agriculture? Is that consistent with what we're trying to accomplish here, or is that going to create uh, difficulties for us? Okay, um, there's another issue, which is personal privacy. Now, property rights and ownership are a little bit different than personal privacy. But it is conceivable that, that privacy implications arise in some of the contexts where we're collecting data. Um, and I don't just mean like when Google Street View has to blur out the face of the cow that it captured, um, or the farmer whose image is inadvertently captured in, uh, in, the, in the data that you collect uh, through your, 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 your field gathering. But I also, um, I, I also mean potentially like land registry information data. So if you wanted to correlate information that you have uh, gathered from the field with, say, land registry records about who owns that, to start to create models about um, economic impacts, match it with commodity prices, profitability of certain enterprises, public information like that, you're going to raise uh, rise uh, privacy concerns. Okay, um, I've mentioned patents and plant breeders rights very briefly only to re-emphasize that everything we know and practice around technology transfer is geared towards this, patents and plant breeders rights, and really the, the whole data issue is falling through the cracks. And one more small point about this is that patents and plant breeders rights are actually quite a useful source of data. The disclosure that happens, unlike in the context of trade secrets, the disclosure that's made when you apply for a patent can be a useful source of data to integrate into our research. Very briefly, there's a whole other can of worms that gets opened up when, when you're dealing with tr traditional knowledge of indigenous and local communities. I'll give you two examples. In respect of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, there are constitutional rights to the protection of Aboriginal people's traditional knowledge. And so anytime you're dealing with the collection of data on uh, the territory or from communities uh, involving First Nations, there's a whole other array of issues, and there are a couple of international treaties that govern these issues in other countries as well. You might be familiar with the Convention on Biological Diversity or what's called the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture. These international treaties contain special provisions 
about accessing and benefit sharing in terms of information, traditional knowledge gathered from indigenous and local communities. So that's an issue to be aware of. Where I'm going to focus uh, most of the rest of my uh, talk is on contracts. All of those other rights that I mentioned are the underlying legal rights that create a basis for us to exchange promises about what we'll do with data. And so contracts are really the big issue here. And in practice, this is how we facilitate open data. We have all of these intellectual property rights that I explained when we create these data, data or databases. And when we want to share that with other people, we negotiate the terms on which others can access that data. And that's, there's a subtle distinction here between open data, which anyone may access, use, and reshare without permission, open data, and what's called or known as shared data, where it's more like a club. You exchange uh, contracts with other people with whom you share the data. So one of the big questions is going to be, how are contracts going to um, be important in this area? So that's contracts both with the people from whom you collect data, the people with whom you share data, the people from whom you receive funding to support the research, the institutions that employ you, your collective agreement, all of these contractual issues are incredibly important. The point I want to emphasize, however, is that the contracts don't create the rights. The contracts allocate the rights. So all of the things I spoke about earlier are the underlying source of your legal rights, and then the contract just allows you to exchange them with other people. Okay, so um, let me move on then. And um, after summarizing sort of the legal landscape here, talk a little bit, very briefly, about what's coming down the pipeline in terms of governance of open data. How are these issues that I just explained going to be resolved? And in a, a paper that, um, that I'm happy to share with you, uh, I've got a couple of printed copies here, but it's also online, and I just actually tweeted this. If you want to get a digital copy, you can um, just go to um, at jdebeer, or the hashtag, the conference hashtag, um, Perk2017, and you'll see this online. You can download it. Um, uh, it's a paper that was produced in a collaboration between, um, between Perk and GoDan, the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Network, and a, another network that, that I run called the Open Air Network, the African Innovation Research Network. And in this collaborative research piece, I identified four different sort of models for solving the issues that we're talking about. The first and the simplest, which in a way is what we're already doing, is interinstitutional collaboration or cooperation. And this is important, and I have, to, I have to stress that we need to be doing this because if we don't do this, the terms are going to be set by actors that we don't control. And so we need to be proactive and determine what kind of norms and practices and rights and obligations we want to set up ourselves so that we're not forced to do something at a later stage, or so we're prepared to engage or consult when the opportunity comes. So interinstitutional cooperation involves, for example, setting up a standard licensing agreement that might be used. I would discourage us from trying to create our own unique model, because what we really want to facilitate here is interoperability. And so interoperability becomes much more difficult when we have not only the technological but the legal Tower of Babel. If we have all of these different legal instruments governing our data compared to other consortia's data that we might want to collaborate with, it makes things more difficult. It increases transaction costs. So I would strongly encourage us to think about other organizations whose open data practices we can tie into. Godan being the world's leading organization. Another great example would be the Creative Commons. Uh, the Creative Commons set of licenses that some of you may use to publish scientific publications or access um, uh, published works. Now, um, there's one other which I think is really interesting. It's an organization, it's a hybrid open source and private sector organization called Provenance. And they use, uh, like we heard a little bit about yesterday, blockchain technology to um, guarantee, uh, to basically track uh, the terms and conditions on which data can be uh, accessed. 
So uh, very briefly, a couple of other models. One is a social certification scheme. So one of the key things about data is as a signal as to what you can do with it and whether that data is actually reliable or not. And I think there's a lot that can be learned by looking at other areas where certification schemes act as a signal to users. Um, fair trade is a really good example. So when you can't, when you don't really know the entire supply chain of a, for a product that you're dealing with, you can rely on the power of a brand or a mark to know that another organization is sort of like assuring you that certain terms and conditions have been adhered to. And so um, in a paper that I'm presenting with some of our other uh, perk funded researchers in the Netherlands next month, we actually explore a social certification uh, scheme for data. Another is model frameworks. And uh, here what I'm thinking is going to happen is like in, in the 1980s, there was a piece of legislation in the United States called the Bayh-Dole Act, and it created a sea change in technology transfer where it became the norm for universities to acquire intellectual property rights in, in inventions that come out of publicly funded research. What we're actually now seeing is the pendulum swinging completely the other direction, and it's the European Commission that is taking the lead in this. There's significant pressure that any research being funded by taxpayers is made available in an open access uh, way immediately or as soon as practical. And that goes for data, not just publications. So we will see the ev evolution of these model frameworks. And then finally, the last point is that um, this is a longer term scenario, but it's, it's not implausible that we will see international agreements like the Convention on Biological Diversity or the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for food and agriculture administered by, by the FAO start to include provisions or, or protocols or annexes that deal with this question of data and access and benefit sharing in respect of data. So that gives you an overview of what some of the key issues around ownership and governance of data are. Um, it's not just a legal issue, it fits with social and technological issues, but it's profoundly important. I hope that I've given you a little sort of uh, tutorial on what kind of rights you've already got or could acquire in respect of the data you're producing and given you a little glimpse into the future of what's going to happen in the international space around governance of uh, agricultural data. And um, with that, let me just repeat my thanks to Megan Blom and, and Jeremy Barbe for all the work that they've done with me and uh, everybody else involved in, in PERC here for the opportunity to share this with you. Thank you.